and John Lee. When you meditate, you have to think. If you don't think, you can't meditate, because thinking forms a necessary part of meditation. Take jhana, for instance. Use your powers of directed thought to bring the mind to the object, and your powers of evaluation to be discriminating in your choice of an object. Examine the object of your meditation to see that it's just right for you. You can choose slow breathing, fast breathing, short breathing, long breathing, narrow breathing, broad breathing, hot, cool, or warm breathing, a breath that goes only as far as the nose, a breath that goes only as far as the base of the throat, a breath that goes all the way down to the heart. When you find an object that suits your taste, catch hold of it and make the mind one, focused on a single object. Once you've done this, evaluate your object. Direct your thoughts to making it stand out. Don't let the mind leave the object. Don't let the object leave the mind. Tell yourself it's like eating. Put the food in line with your mouth. Put your mouth in line with the food. Don't miss. If you miss and go sticking the food in your ear, under your chin, or in your eye, or on your forehead, you'll never get anywhere in your eating. So it is with your meditation. Sometimes the one object of your mind takes a sudden sharp turn into the past, back hundreds of years. Sometimes it takes off into the future and comes back with all sorts of things to clutter your mind. This is like taking your food, sticking it up over your head, and letting it fall down behind you. The dogs are sure to get it. Or like bringing the food to your mouth and then tossing it out in front of you. When you find this happening, it's a sign that your mind hasn't been made snug with its object. Your powers of directed thought aren't firm enough. You have to bring the mind to the object and keep after it to make sure that it stays put. Like eating, make sure the food is in line with the mouth and, it, and stick it right in. This is directed thought. The food is in line with the mouth, the mouth is in line with the food. You're sure that it's food and you know what kind it is, main course or dessert, coarse or refined. Once you know what's what and it's in your mouth, chew it right up. This is evaluation, examining, reviewing your meditation. Sometimes this comes under threshold concentration. Examining a coarse object to make it more and more refined. If you find that the breath is long, examine long breathing. If it's short, examine short breathing. If it's slow, examine slow breathing to see if the mind will stay with that kind of breath, to see if that kind of breathing will stay with the mind, to see whether or not the breath is smooth and unhindered. This is evaluation. When the mind gives rise to directed thought and evaluation, you have both concentration and discernment. Directed thought and singleness of preoccupation fall under the heading of concentration. Evaluation under the heading of discernment. When you have both concentration and discernment, the mind is still and knowledge can arise. If there's too much evaluation, though, it can destroy your stillness of mind. If there's too much stillness, it can snuff out thought. You have to watch over the stillness of your mind to make sure that you have things in the right proportions. If you don't have a sense of just right, you're in for trouble. If the mind is too still, your progress will be slow. If you think too much, it will run away with your concentration. So observe things carefully. Again, it's like eating. If you go shoveling food into your mouth, you might end up choking to death. You have to ask yourself, is it good for me? Can I handle it? Are my teeth strong enough? Some people have nothing but empty gums, and yet they still want to eat sugar cane. It's not normal. Some people, even though their teeth are aching and falling out, still want to eat crunchy foods. So it is with the mind. As soon as it's just a little bit still, we want to see this, know that, we want to take on more than we can handle. You first have to make sure that your concentration is solidly based, that your discernment and concentration are properly balanced. This point is very important. Your powers of evaluation have to be ripe, your directed thought firm. Say you have a water buffalo, tie it to a stake and pound the stake deep into the ground. If your buffalo is strong, it just might walk or run away with a stake, and then it's all over the place. You have to know your buffalo's strength. If it's really strong, pound the stake so that it's firmly in the ground and keep watching over it. In other words, if you find that the obsessiveness of your thinking is getting out of hand, going beyond the bounds of mental stillness, fix the mind in place and make it extra still, but not so still that you lose track of things. If the mind is too quiet, it's like being in a daze. You don't know what's going on at all. Everything is dark, blotted out. Or else you have good and bad spells sinking out of sight and then popping up again. This is concentration without directed thought or evaluation, 
with no sense of judgment, wrong concentration. So you have to be observant. Use your judgment. But don't let the mind get carried away by its thoughts. Your thinking is something separate. The mind stays with the meditation object. Wherever your thoughts may go spinning, your mind is still firmly based, like holding on to a post and spinning around and around. You can keep on spinning, and yet it doesn't wear you out. But if you let go of the post and spin around three times, you get dizzy and bang, fall flat, <coughs> fall flat on your face. So it is with the mind. If it stays for the singleness of its preoccupation, it can keep thinking and not get tired, not get harmed. Your thinking is chinta mayapanya, your stillness, pavana mayapanya. They're right there together. This is the strategy of skillfulness, discernment on the level of concentration practice. Thinking and stillness keep staying together like this. When we practice generosity, it comes under the level of appropriate attention. When we practice virtue, it comes under the level of appropriate attention. And when we practice concentration, we don't lose a beat. It comes under the same sort of principle, only more advanced, directed thought and evaluation. When you have directed thought and evaluation in charge of the mind, then the more you think, the more solid and sure the mind gets. The more you sit and meditate, the more you think. The mind becomes more and more firm until all the hindrances fall away. The mind no longer has to go looking for concepts. Now it can give rise to knowledge. The knowledge here is an ordinary knowledge. It washes away your old knowledge. You don't want the knowledge that comes from ordinary thinking and reasoning. Let go of it. You don't want the knowledge that comes from directed thought and evaluation. Stop. Make the mind quiet. Still. When the mind is still and unhindered, this is the essence of all that's meritorious and skillful. When your mind is on this level, it isn't attached to any concepts at all. All the concepts you've known, dealing with the world or the Dhamma, however many or few, are washed away. Only when they're washed away can new knowledge arise. This is why we're taught not to hold on to concepts, all the labels and names we have for things. You have to let yourself be poor. It's when people are poor that they become ingenious and resourceful. If you don't let yourself be poor, you'll never gain any discernment. In other words, if you don't in other words, in other words, you don't have to be afraid of being stupid or of missing out on things. You don't have to be afraid that you'll hit a dead end. You don't want any of the insights you've gained from listening to others or from reading books, because they're concepts and therefore inconstant. You don't want any of the insights you've gained by reasoning and thinking, because they're concepts and therefore not self. Let all of these insights disappear, leaving the mind firmly intent, leaning neither to the left, towards self-affliction, or being displeased, or to the right, towards sensual indulgence, or being pleased. Keep the mind still, quiet, neutral, impassive, set tall. And there you are, right concentration. When right concentration arises in the mind, it has a shadow. When you can catch sight of the shadow appearing, that's vipassana, insight meditation. Vipassana yana is the first branch of knowledge and skill in the Buddhist teachings. The second branch is itiwati, the power of the mind over matter. The third is manomayati, the power of mind weighed images. The fourth is dipajaku, clairvoyance. The fifth is Dipasoda, clear audience. The sixth is Jeto Brayayana, the ability to read minds. The seventh is Bhupenyuasanusitayana, knowledge of previous lifetimes. And the eighth, Asuakayana, knowledge of the ending of mental fermentations. All eight of these branches are forms of knowledge and skill that arise from concentration. People without concentration can't gain them. That's an absolute guarantee. No matter how smart or clever they may be, they can't gain these forms of knowledge. They have to fall under the power of ignorance. These eight branches of knowledge come from right concentration. When they arise, they're not called thoughts or ideas. They're called right views. What looks wrong to you is really wrong. What looks right is really right. If what looks right is really wrong, that's wrong view. If what looks wrong is really right, again, wrong view. With right view, though, right looks right and wrong looks wrong. To put it in terms of cause and effect, you see the Four Noble Truths. You see stress, and it really is stressful. You see the cause of stress arising, and it's really causing stress. These are Noble Truths, absolutely, undeniably, indisputably true. You see that stress has a cause. Once the cause arises, there has to be stress. As for the way to the disbanding of stress, you see that the path you're following will, without a doubt, lead to Nibbana. Whether or not you go all the way, what you see is correct. This is right view. 
as for the disbanding of stress. You see that there really is such a thing. You see that as long as you're on this path, stress does in fact fall away. When you've come to realize the truth of these things in your heart, that's vipassana yana. To put it even more simply, you see that all things, inside as well as out, are undependable. The body is undependable. Aging is undependable. Death is undependable. They're slippery characters, constantly changing on you. To see this is to see inconstancy. Don't let yourself be pleased by inconstancy. Don't let yourself be upset. Keep the mind neutral on an even keel. This is what's meant by vipassana. Sometimes inconstancy makes us happy. Sometimes it makes us sad. Say we hear that a person we don't like is going to be demoted or sick or dying. It makes us gleeful, and we can't wait for him or her to die. His body is impermanent, life is uncertain, it can change, but we're glad. That's a defilement. Say we hear that a son or a daughter has become wealthy, influential, and famous. We become happy. Again, our mind is strayed from the noble path. It's not firmly in right concentration. We have to make the mind neutral, not thrilled over things, not upset over things. Not thrilled when our plans succeed, not upset when they don't. When we can make the mind neutral like this, that's the neutrality of right view. We see what's wrong, what's right, and try to steer the mind away from the wrong and toward the right. This is called right resolve, part of vipassana yana. The same holds true with stress, whether it's our stress and pain or somebody else's. Say we hear that an enemy is suffering, glad to hear it, we think, hope they hurry up and die. The heart is tilted. So we hear that a friend has become wealthy and we become happy, or a son or daughter is ill and we become sad. Our mind has fallen in with suffering and stress. Why? Because we don't have any knowledge. We're unskilled. The mind isn't centered. In other words, it's not in right concentration. We have to look after the mind. Don't let it fall in with stress. Whatever suffers, let it suffer, but don't let the mind suffer with it. The people in the world may be pained, but your mind isn't pained along with them. Pain may arise in the body, but the mind isn't pained along with it. Let the body go ahead and suffer, but the mind doesn't suffer. Keep the mind neutral. Don't be pleased by pleasure either. Pleasure is a form of stress, you know. How so? It can change. It can rise and fall. It can be high and low. It can't last. That's stress. Pain is also stress, double stress. When you gain this sort of insight into stress, when you really see stress, vipassana has arisen in the mind. As for anatta, not self, once we've examined things and seen them for what they really are, we don't make claims, we don't display influence, we don't try to show that we have the right or the power to bring things that are not self under our control. No matter how hard we may try, we can't prevent birth, aging, illness, and death. If the body is going to be old, let it be old. If it's going to hurt, let it hurt. If it has to die, let it die. Don't be pleased by death, either your own or that of others. Don't be upset by death, your own or that of others. Keep the mind neutral, unruffled, unfazed. This is Sankara Bekayana, letting Sankara's all fabrication follow their own inherent nature. The mind like this is in Vipassana. This is the first branch of knowledge, Vipassana in brief. You see that all things fashioned are inconstant, stressful, and not self. You can disentangle them from your grasp. You can let go. This is where it gets good. How so? You don't have to wear yourself out lugging Sankara's around. To be attached means we carry a load, and there are five heaps that we carry. Rupupadanakanto, physical phenomena of the first load, Vedanupadanakanto, feelings that we're attached to are another. Sanyupadanakanto, the concepts and labels that we claim that we claim are ours, are a pole for carrying a load on our shoulder. Sankarupekanakanto, the metal fabrications that we hang on to and think are ours. Vinyanupadakanto, our attachment to sensory consciousness. Go ahead, carry them around. Hang one load from your left leg and one from your right. Put one on your left shoulder and one on your right. Put the last load on your head. And now carry them wherever you go, clumsy, encumbered, and comical. Parahuevanchakanda, go ahead and carry them, the five kandas are a heavy load. As individuals, we burden ourselves with them. Carry them wherever you go, and you waste your time suffering in the world. The Buddha taught that whoever lacks discernment, whoever is unskilled, whoever doesn't practice concentration leading to vipassana, will have to be burdened with stress, 
will always be loaded down. It's pathetic. It's a shame. They'll never get away. When they're loaded down like this, it's really pathetic. Their legs are burdened, their shoulders are burdened, and where are they going? Three steps forward and two steps back. Soon they'll get discouraged, and then after a while they'll pick themselves up and get going again. And when we see in constancy that all fabrications, whether within us or without, are undependable, when we see that they're stressful, when we see that they're not ourself, that they simply whirl around in and of themselves, when we gain these insights we can put down our burdens, in other words, let go of our attachments. We can put down the past, i.e. stop dwelling in it. We can let go of the future, i.e. stop yearning for it. We can let go of the present, i.e. stop claiming it as the self. Once these three big baskets have fallen from our shoulders, we can walk with a light step. We can even dance. We're beautiful. Wherever we go, people will be glad to know us. Why? Because we're not encumbered. Whatever we do, we can do with ease. We can walk, run, dance, and sing, all with a light heart. For Buddhism's beauty, a sight for sore eyes, graceful wherever we go. No longer burdened, no longer encumbered. We can be at our ease. This is Vipassana Yana, the first branch of knowledge.